Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Windows 365 Accelerator. We have an exciting two hours in store with some of the best minds and some of the brightest talent in the Windows 365 team, really walk you through what Windows 365 is and also how to administer it as an, admin, as, as an admin so you can have in Windows 365 up and running in your environments as quickly as possible. So joining me today, I've actually got Scott Manchester from the Windows 365 team, a leader on Windows 365. Also, Kristen Brinkhoff, who's also very uh, active in the community for Windows 365 and on the Windows 365 engineering team. So guys, why don't you introduce yourselves and what you're working on? Hi folks, I'm Scott Manchester. I'm the uh, Director of Program Management for Windows 365. I'm a 21 year veteran at Microsoft and have spent the last 10 years working in the virtualization space. And I couldn't be more excited than to share with you some of the innovations coming with Windows 365 throughout this session today. So hi everyone, I'm a Christian Rinkoff. I'm a feature PM on the Windows 365 team as well as a community lead. I'm happy to be here and I'm one of the PMs uh, leading the Windows integration features that Scott and Jeremy will share in just a bit. And after that, we will jump into some deeper demos as well as hands-on experiences on how to deploy Windows 365. And after that, I'm there as well to give you some best practices and troubleshooting tips for Windows 365. So it would be a great morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you're joining from. So uh, stay tuned and looking forward to it. All right, so why don't we kick this off with a question that I think a few people have on, on, this, uh, on this live stream. What is Windows 365? What are kind of some of the components? How does it work? Is it the right solution for me? So we're going to do, I'm going to present with Scott and really talk about what Windows 365 is and some of the background to it and where it fits, where it fits in the whole technology spectrum that you're deploying now. So Scott, why don't you take it over and tell us what Windows 365 is all about? Thanks for the intro, Jeremy. Um, so First off, Windows 365 is an entire new class of computing. And uh, if you can stay with us for the whole session today, I'm sure you will uh, have a deep understanding of why we made this very significant declaration of Windows 365 being a new class of computing that we call Cloud PC. Um, it a, certainly is a virtualization technology, but it's like no other in the market today. And you're going to learn a little bit about where we're taking this in the future as we walk you through some of the integration that's coming in Windows with Windows 365. At the surface, Windows 365 provides a very powerful and personalized and secure experience for delivering Windows 10 or Windows 11. It's built in the cloud and provides all that elasticity that the cloud brings, but it's designed to mimic the experience from an admin perspective and how easy it is to set up and manage like a physical machine and to an end user, it looks and feels like their personal desktop. It's all their apps, contents and settings, everything streamed from the cloud and it's powerful and scalable in multiple directions, meaning I can onboard lots of new users into the service and decommission them as needed. I can scale up any individual's VM size from a very large VM and shrink it down dynamically. So it's got all these elasticity in multiple dimensions to provide a very flexible compute experience for admins and very simple to use for end users as well. And of course, it brings with it all the new security enhancements provided by Windows 11. So this particular slide here is something I've presented you know, for the last 10 years as common use case scenarios for any virtualization solution. And man, has the world changed in those last 10 years where different uh, segments of these scenarios have become even more critical to many enterprise and small business customers. Obviously, data security has been never more important than it is today with all of nation state attacks and, and other hacks, viruses and, and other uh, things that, that put your integrity of your corporate data at risk. With Windows 365, we provide a very easy mechanism to provision secure environments for your end users. High capacity computing has been never more important than it is today. Many organizations work with large data sets, work with a highly distributed workforce that's spread out perhaps around the world or around the country at a minimum. Using compute experiences powered from the cloud, not only do you get this high performance computing opportunities, but you also have all of these machines linked across our global footprint of Azure with a high speed data connection. So when you're remote employees are collaborating on large files and using Windows 365, they get all the benefit of the high speed backplane and connecting all these machines around the globe. So if you're moving around large data sets or working on large files, 
the flexibility and power you get when you remote into these machines is far better than you'd get if they were sitting in their home working across the public internet and trying to collaborate. And of course, many factors have contributed to the explosive growth of bring your own PC. Many organizations now are using this as their standard model now. Someone joins the organization, whether they're a full-time employee or contractor, they can now empower them to use whatever device they already have to get access to a secure Windows 365 experience. We're gonna show you some demos here in a minute how we really embrace that and provide a very easy way for users to move between their local compute experience and the secured Windows 365 experience provided by their organization. Disaster recovery, that's the top of mind for many organizations, especially as they make this leap from on-prem where they control all this data to moving to the cloud. They wanna depend on services that have disaster recovery built into the core capability. We'll walk you through a number of scenarios with Windows 365 where we provide a very resilient compute experience uh, on multiple layers uh, to make sure that you have many ways of recovering any potential uh, threats or attacks and also provide guardrails to ensure your end users uh, have a very uh, consistent uh, and reliable ser service offering. We talked about the elasticity of Windows 365, the ability to onboard new employees and offboard them in a very simple manner. We do this in a zero touch and a zero trust kind of model where I can provision cloud PCs for users anywhere in the world in a matter of minutes, and I have no need to have a physical exchange of hardware or any uh, company secrets or anything between the two of us. So lots of flexibility we provide there, and you'll see some of these demos later today as we walk through the provisioning and deployment uh, solutions. And M&A activities, right? There's been a lot of activity right now in mergers and acquisitions, and virtualization has been a very common technology used to make it easy for the acquiring uh, company to provide access to all their corporate resources uh, through a virtualization environment and easily get people on ramped while also maintaining uh, the work environment uh, of the company being acquired as well. If you think about all these different scenarios, classically, you know, in IT, these would these would take a lot of work, a lot of infrastructure to manage, a lot of things that you would need to do to make sure services are up and running. And the nice thing with Windows 365 is the software as a service platform really keen on that whole idea of simplicity to make sure that you can have, you know, these types of advanced capabilities with very little effort from the IT perspective. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So let's talk a little bit more about that. First off, Windows 365 focuses on, on the, the, the primary objective we have with any M365 product, something that has to be loved by users, something where users feel like they have this modern experience of working in a modern organization. They feel like they're empowered to do the basic things that they've come accustomed to on a physical machine, like being able to hold their finger down on the power button and, and do a cold reboot uh, when, when they get into a bad state. Uh, or be able to recover from a bad state and have this personalized experience that's always available to them. We'll talk a lot about all the unique features that we can bring forward with Windows 365 because the unique architecture that we provide with our cloud PC. And of course, it has to be trusted by IT. It has to be familiar to them as well. You know, having a separate model of how you provision and manage virtual machines uh, is a lot of overhead for many organizations. It's been the thing that's kept traditional virtualization from really hitting the mass market appeal. You know, the complexity of having a completely different workflow for building and managing, distributing, and securing your corporate workloads in a physical environment should be the same as it is in a virtual environment. And that's where Windows 365, as you'll see in these demos, really blends that together. So from an IT admin perspective, they're just PCs, whether they're in the cloud or a physical PC that you deliver to somebody. So we'll talk a little bit more about these two things, but Windows 365 is the epitome of a product that really addresses the needs of end users and the needs of admin. If you've got both solutions available for you know, smaller or medium-sized businesses and also larger enterprises, so what are some of the differences in terms of feature sets and what, what are the right options for any of the viewers that are watching? We've got a couple hundred online right now in terms of which ones to select. Yeah, that's great transition to the next couple of slides where we'll talk about Windows 365 business, uh, which is really targeted at small businesses, small to medium sized businesses. So, so we, we, we say basically at that kind of 300 mark. Uh, many organizations at that level might choose the enterprise product or, or the business product. As you get down into those smaller organizations, all the way down to what we call our very small businesses or VSBs, this is where Windows 365 is really distinct from other virtualization solutions in that there is no fixed cost, meaning I can deploy 
Windows 365 so from to a sole proprietorship where there's only one employee. And it's very economically viable for them to do that because there's no fixed cost that I have to amortize across a group of users. I can simply deploy one machine. I don't need a domain controller. I don't need an Azure VNet. I don't even need an Azure subscription. I can purchase, deploy, manage, consume all from a single portal experience and do this with a very small businesses. Windows 365 Enterprise is obviously targeted to our larger organizations, organizations that already do management inside of Intune, inside the Microsoft Endpoint Management Portal, or looking to modernize their deployment and start to on that journey of building, deploying, and managing their compute experiences inside of our modern Endpoint Management Tool, where all of the Windows 365 Enterprise management takes place. And you'll see some really great demos of how all of this works as we get later into the session. I'll walk you through a little more detail of the breakdown of the two products, just for those that are curious about where the differentiation and capability are. Both of these are designed to be super simple and to leverage the existing skill set organizations have. In the case of small businesses, we assume that they are not familiar with any of our admin portals, that they simply will land at windows365.com, discover the service, discover the options they have, deploy that and be up and running in a matter of minutes. That's really how it was built. So it's designed with a set of core features that make it super simple, super simple to use, super simple to manage, and doesn't require a lot of central IT. Windows 365 Enterprise, on the other hand, is built inside of the Microsoft Endpoint Management Portal and provides all the flexibility that large organizations typically require. They have the ability to provision on a Microsoft hosted network, they can provision on their own VNet and any Azure data center that they choose within the regions we support. Uh, and they can even do hybrid models where they can have one set of users that are hybrid joined, another set of users that are native joined, some that are provisioned on a corporate VNet, some that are on a Microsoft hosted network and can be distributed all around the world. All the flexibility that you typically require with large organizations and multinational organizations that might have footprints all around the globe, Windows 365 Enterprise is fine tuned to support those organizations. We've been very busy since we released this product in August of last year. It's, it's amazing to think we're not even a year old yet. And we've been so engaged with the customers that are deploying this now that we've been able to bring in features that they've requested as they've started to consume this service, either in our preview programs and now since it's been in GA. And we can rapidly respond uh, to feature requests, listening to the voice of our customers. If you see the link up in the upper right corner here, this aka.ms slash W365 feedback, this is where you can go and either put in your own feature ideas or features that you'd like to see in the service, or you can upvote existing ones. And all of these features that you see here today were influenced by customer feedback, customers like yourself going to the site and telling us the features and things they'd like to see. Um, so some of the things that we've done in the last eight months, uh, one is we built this really, a uh, powerful Windows 365 web client that just went GA just a few days ago. This is a highly, highly optimized Windows 365 experience delivered through a browser. Uh, and many of our customers are using this as their primary way of getting access to it because it is such a rich experience here. It's super fast and super performant. It was built from the ground up using new architectures like WebAssembly to run the RDP stack in a very performant way inside of uh, your browser. You get things like alternate keyboards, you get accessibility improvements. You can even take your Windows 365 cloud PC and you can bookmark it. So you can actually click on a favorites and go exactly into your Windows 365 cloud PC without any interstitial pages, very popular feature. And of course, one of our top requested features since we launched the service was bringing that native Azure directory join option to our enterprise product, allowing organizations now to deploy some or all of their workloads using uh, native Azure Active Directory join. And optionally, they can provision this on their own VNet, or they can opt now to provision on a Microsoft hosted network, so you don't even need an Azure subscription again with Windows 365 Enterprise now. And of course, the Windows 11 experience, we're gonna talk a lot about some of the futures and where we're going with the integration of Windows 365 and Windows 11. But when we launched this at day one, when we when Windows 11 went GA, we went GA with support for this on Windows 365 providing the full hardware compatibility to ensure you get the most secure and best Windows 11 experience delivered through Windows 365. And of course, we've been working a lot on all of the management and configuration options that admins want to ensure that end users get the best experience. We now support nested virtualization. So if you've got the need to run development tools, uh, WSL, things like that, that require you running nested Hyper-V, we support that uh, with a few of our SKUs today. 
Uh, coming forward uh, in, in GA soon is our point in time restore feature. One of my most exciting new features. This is free. This is no upcharge for this. We provide 10 restore points to your Windows 365 Cloud PC. We do four week rolling restore points and then six configurable restore points. This means if at any point in time a user gets their machine into a bad state, you can roll back four hours, 24 hours, a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks uh, to ensure that they get back to a known good state. And of course, the reset feature has been there since day one where you can go all the way back to where the machine was originally provisioned and redeploy that as well. Point in time restore is available for both the business and the enterprise SKU, and it is super slick the way that it's built, super simple to use. Tons of new admin features on the business side. We built and rebuilt the portal so you can do the entire workflow end to end, purchase, assign, create new users, assign licenses to users, configure uh, global or, or individual admin settings, everything now in a unified portal. You don't need to break out of the Windows 365 portal at all to complete all your tasks now. Um, and now we provide the ability for you to assign either admin uh, or standard user rights in our business and our and our enterprise product. So some groups of users, you may want to give them for full admin access on their cloud PC, and some users you may want to restrict a standard user. That's now configurable in both the enterprise and the business uh, product. Um, one other thing, I just want to also reiterate the Azure AD join native support. Uh, this is something also that makes it really easy to get started and you don't have to build out a domain controller or connect things to your local uh, directory service if you want to spin up an environment just to see how everything works and for the point in time restore this is an amazing capability for especially cases where you know you've got security incidents as well i need to go back to a known mm -hmm. good state so you've got always those restore points to fall back to in those cases so there's a couple of really uh great capabilities here that that will make things a lot easier just to get started and also make things from a protection standpoint or getting away from corruption standpoint a lot better just for stability yeah that's a good point and and you know as we add this ability now to allow users to be standard user or or admin you know it's it's always risky to give a user admin access because you never know what software they might install so bringing that point in time restore feature along with the ability to configure mm -hmm. users for admin access are kind of a great pair because if they do happen to get into a bad state and installed some software inadvertently or there was a some sort of a hack on the machine to be able to go back to one of these points in times is part of that bcdr story we talked about earlier that business continuity that we really focused on when we built this service Definitely. That's a good segue into some of the up and coming features, which further extend this capability to provision secure and uh, and high level business continuity capabilities to the solution. So we talked about um, bringing on the native Azure Active Directory join. Coming soon will be the ability to do a single sign on end to end. We do cache credentials now, so it's a pretty smooth experience today, but we'll further reduce the times that users have to provide their password by providing SSO support. We're also taking Windows 365 to both our GCC and our GCC high government clouds. So for you uh, organizations out there that might be representative of government agencies, we have uh, support for this coming uh, later this year and early next year. We're going to show you a lot of this experience uh, category of new features. We're going to show you the new Windows 365 app integrated into Windows 11. We're going to show you how easy it is to switch between your corporate and your and your personal desktop. And to show you a new model of computing where you can configure a Windows 11 device to boot directly into Windows 365. And then a very forward looking scenario where now you can take your Windows 365 experience and even in a disconnected state to be able to still work on that uh, on that compute experience on your local device and resynchronize when Internet connectivity is restored. So we'll show you some demos of those four things uh, in that category. We're doing a lot of tools to give admins visibility into the workload of their their cloud PCs. When we launched the product, we launched really innovative new features built into the endpoint analytics reporting functions inside of Microsoft Endpoint Management Portal. Tools that allow you to measure, excuse me, measure the latency and the relative performance a user has with their cloud PC, and then wiring that up to tools that would let you dynamically resize that user's machine up or down based on the their usage of the virtual machines. We're adding tons of more features now. We're building a full real-time unified um, metrics and dashboard inside of the portal. We're building uh, uh, notification services. So if there's any kind of an event that can trigger a notification, we've got multiple ways to notify admins of any alerts or things around the service. We're providing more tools to validate the health of the environment as well as the health of any individual PC. 
Behind the scenes, Windows 365 has a service that we call the Watchdog Service, and Jeremy and I talked a lot about that when we announced that product uh, back in July. Um, but that watchdog service in itself is one of the more innovative features of Windows 365. This service monitors your environment to ensure that your environment that you're hosting these workloads is healthy and secure. Uh, and this has helped many of our customers that have traditionally struggled with, with virtualization solutions like VDI, um, where maintaining their own environment became the, my, the major overhead in terms of cost and just uh, time and energy. Um, so with the Windows 365 Watchdog service, we provide tons of things that we analyze to ensure that environment is up and running and to notify you, your admins, if any uh, environment variable changes that would keep a user from having a, a good experience. And we're continuing to add more and more of these checks, these health checks into our Watchdog service. And then of course, around the security and management, we're building in all that secure boot capabilities of Windows 11 into our core platform. Another a uh, really exciting new feature is our e-discovery feature. This feature is uh, initially designed to provide organizations a mechanism, either through compliance uh, or internal policies to do e-discovery, forensic analysis on any one user's Windows 365 Cloud PC. Under the covers, what this means is you can take any user's Cloud PC and you can move it to a shared storage location. You create a storage location on Azure, uh, and then we can actually take any of your VHDs and move them up into that storage location. This is a really great opportunity for you to meet compliance or requirements you have internally around e-discovery, but it's also another form of resiliency as well. Those VHDs, once you've archived them and stored them in your own storage location, in the event of a total catastrophic failure, you could always recover those VHDs anywhere, on Azure, on-prem. So it's a great way of having this full ripcord BCDR strategy. It's a way of meeting all your compliance requirements you might have around forensic analysis of any in individual's uh, compute workload or data, um, and just reinforcing a, a strong BCDR strategy for your organization. So let's get into some of the more exciting stuff. I'd love to show you guys uh, some of the features that are coming. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about briefly before we get into some of the new stuff is what's happening around integrating the Teams experience with Windows 365. If you're a heavy Teams user, like, like most of us on this call are, uh, and you use it inside of a virtualization workload, you've seen great progress in the last 12 months. Amazing amount of activity that's gone on to make sure that Teams works really well inside of any virtualization environment. But we have some unique opportunities with Windows 365 being it's a personal desktop uh, to provide a great experience even beyond that. So even with all the great innovation we've seen to date, there's still a lot more coming. One is we're going to bring the, the background blur. Uh, so you'll be able to have the background blurred out when you're when you're hosting uh, your uh, team session from a virtualized environment. Each window will be a child window like it is when you run it on the native uh, natively in Windows, so you'll get sub windows for all of your, your events like this session we're in now. Uh, you'll be able to transfer your session to your phone. Uh, you'll be able to see live captions and transcripts. You'll be able to give other users control of the session. And all of these things are coming first to Windows, but all rolling out to other clients like Mac, which now has many of these features in preview now uh, with the Mac Teams client for virtualization. There's a separate work stream happening even beyond all of these great new features rolling forward into our virtualized uh, estates for Teams. Coming soon will be full integration of Teams experience where new features will simply go out for bare metal, running local, as well as in the virtualized world as well. So sometime next year, we'll see this transition where all features will now begin to sim ship and, and this delta between the experience on a physical device and the delta on a virtual device will close once and for all. So exciting innovation happening around Teams on Windows 365 and of course other uh, unified communication apps like Zoom and others work with Windows 365 very well also. One of the more exciting things I think that we announced uh, on April 5th when we did the Windows commercial event was really that integration between Windows and Windows 365 and kind of blurring the lines, making it easier to access your cloud PCs, whether you're starting booting your PC, whether you're in the session, so Scott, why don't we spend some time talking through, you know, some of the things that we can do or will be able to do, I should say, in the future in terms of again blurring those lines and integrating the two different Windows environments. One of the first things I think that uh, is is sometimes challenging is going from, you know, cold boot booting into an OS and then going into your your client, whatever that client is or the browser, or then connecting to your cloud PC. And we're making that even better now, right? With with something that we call Windows 365 boot. 
Yeah, that's exactly right, Jeremy. One of one of the more exciting features that we announced a few weeks ago at the Windows commercial event was this new capability we call Windows 365 Boot. And as Jeremy pointed out, it, it just provides a new mechanism for you to configure a Windows 11 device into a mode that we call MinWin, meaning the, the Windows shell goes into this minimized state where it just provides all the basic necessities to get connected to the internet, but then now it is just a portal to your Windows 365 Cloud PC. This device could be a variety of different form factors. One of the more exciting new ones is more of a tablet device, more of a device that you can easily pass from first line worker to first line worker as they move between shifts. And all the first line worker needs to do is hold this up to their face, log in with their face ID, and they're booted directly into their Windows 365 Cloud PC experience. This configuration of a Windows 11 device into this MinWin will be something you'll be able to do either through autopilot. Um, so as the device is provisioned and delivered to the user, um, it's already set up this way or something that might be able to be configured directly through the Microsoft Endpoint Management Portal to put this device into this mode. Well, let's take a look and, and see what this experience looks like real quick. So this, this scenario goes by pretty quick intentionally because at the end of the day, this is designed to be super simple. So here I am at this new device configured into this Windows 365 boot mode. I'm going to log in with my face using my camera here. And now instead of booting to the local shell, I'm booted directly into my Windows 365 experience. So here I am where I left off last. One of the other unique capabilities of Windows 365 is that it is my personal desktop. This is my machine and it's always where I left it the last time I was using it. So I might have been working on this spreadsheet on a Friday night. When I log back in on Monday in that super simple mode you just saw, I'm right back where I was in context, right in the middle of that spreadsheet I was working on. I might have a Word doc open, a PowerPoint, some emails I was reading. Everything's right where I left it. We talk about that loved by users, trusted by IT. When I give a user an experience that's identical to what they have on their laptop, right? For the last decade, we've all opened our laptop and it's right where we left it. And we just take that for granted. That's just the way it works and the way it's worked for the last decade. And, and, and we feel very confident on a Friday when we shut the laptop down that I'm not gonna totally lose all the context of what I was doing on Monday. That experience is often lost when a user's workload is hosted through a traditional virtualization environment. But that is something we maintain. We bring that same capabilities forward to ensure that user has that great experience with their personal desktop. You know, and the, one of the other things I think in terms of uh, getting to your cloud PC is a lot of people are doing hybrid work these days. They're using personal devices. Maybe, maybe they do have something that was given to them by their by their company. But we need a we need a higher level of security. We need to make sure that the that the uh, Windows 365 cloud PC is always in a managed state. So why don't you talk through some of the some of the um, in, in, in integration that we have going from an online like a running session of Windows into Windows 365 and what's coming with Windows 365 switch? Yeah, great uh, intro on that, uh, Jeremy. As, as we mentioned earlier on when we walked through those six scenarios that are very traditional scenarios for virtualization that really come to life now with cloud PC and Windows 365. We talk about that bring your own PC scenario. This is becoming more and more prominent. It was already a trend happening before COVID and all the supply chain issues that, that we've seen to date. So it's more prevalent than ever today where organizations are saying just use whatever device you already have and we'll give you access to that workload, uh, the corporate workload hosted from the cloud. Well, this puts users in a situation where they need to navigate between their local device and the local operating system and this virtualized operating system. With Windows 365 Switch, we're going to make it very simple to discover and move between your cloud PC and your local device. So let's walk you through a demo of that and show you what this will look like. So this demo goes by very quick, intentionally, because it's designed to be super simple for end users. The Windows 365 Switch is built into the new desktop uh, task viewer that you see built into the task bar here. So right next to the search bar, you'll see this new icon here, which is the task viewer icon. So I'm going to run this demo real quick and you'll see how easy this user is able to click on that task view icon, see their both their local desktops where they might have configured more than one. So here you can see I've got a desktop configured with my games and my personal photos. I might have another local desktop where I keep all the apps, my you know my uh, productivity apps, my personal outlook and, and uh, other office products. Now we fully integrate in your cloud PCs. Now this user logged in with their AAD identity. That's all they needed to do. No configuration required by the IT admin, no software to install. They've simply logged in with their AAD identity or they logged in with 
other credentials and then launched any M365 services where they have an AAD token. With that in mind, let me walk you through this demo real quick. So here the user will click on the task view icon and simply just hovering on it, you will see that you have not only local desktops, but you've got this new cloud PC option. And this cloud PC option, you'll notice it was that same view you saw before, that spreadsheet that was running last. And that's how quickly I just switched from my local PC to my cloud PC. I'm clicking on the same task view within the cloud PC and I'm back to my local desktop. I know that demo goes by really quick and that's really the point of it, is it's so easy now to switch between my local compute experience and my Windows 365 cloud PC experience and to be able to do that in a way that's very consistent. No software install, no training or configuration required for the end user. They simply log in with their AAD credentials. Okay, Scott. So one of the questions that you and I, I think, both get a lot, uh, probably since even the days of terminal services, what if I don't have connection to the internet or to be able to get to that service? Maybe I have an intermittent failure in connection or no internet for a point in time. How would I use a cloud PC then in that in that type of uh, situation? Yeah, that is really the holy grail of any virtualization solution is to be able to provide a mechanism where even in a disconnected state, I can be productive. So when we launched Windows 365 back in July at our Inspire event, Satya uh, announced it in his keynote and he announced it as not just a new service offering, but this new category of computing called Cloud PC. And we backed up that bold statement. Hey, a new category of computing, that's a pretty bold thing to say. We backed that up with a ton of features that we showcased right when we released the product. Features that make it really simple for IT admins to provision this in a trusted way, and features that make a user feel like this is a modern, powerful experience it's, that's more commensurate with a physical machine than anything they've used before. But we also announced that one of the areas that we're taking Windows 365 is to blend more between the physical and the virtual experience. You see some of that already with the few demos I've shown you now, but the holy grail is to be able to support a scenario where on a, on a well uh, accommodated local device, meaning I need to have a little more uh, memory and storage than, than a thin client device, on a device like this, I can take my Windows 365 experience, access it remotely when I have connectivity, and then if internet connectivity is lost, I have a local copy of that VHD. We talked about our ability to export the VHD, the, the user um, uh, uh, VM, the virtual machine, and a copy of that virtual machine to be able to export it. Well, now we are providing a mechanism to synchronize that. So it's a synchronized copy of it running in the cloud and running locally. So at any point in time, if I lose connectivity, I can still work on that uh, cloud PC in a secure way. When an internet connectivity is restored, everything syncs up again and I seamlessly transition to the cloud. Let me show you what this looks like here. So same scenario, except this time I'm now a knowledge worker and I'm, I'm traveling. I'm heading off to meet with a customer. I'm at the airport. I'm making some last minute changes to this spreadsheet. And as I begin to board the plane, I lose internet connectivity and I'm asked if I want to move to work in an offline mode. I say yes. And now, my, my local copy of my cloud PC is launched and I'm able to continue to work offline. Now, of course, I don't have internet connectivity, but I can do static type of things like what I normally do on a plane, working within Outlook or, or any uh, productivity app that has an offline mode. When I land at the other side and an internet connectivity is restored, I simply transition back to running that workload out of the cloud. So there's a lot of innovation happening under the covers here that make this a very seamless experience and a very powerful experience uh, for travelers and people that want to make sure that they can be productive even in a disconnected state with their cloud PC. One thing to point out here, these some of these capabilities are in the future. They're, they're a bit further out, but I think something that's closer are the updates that we're going to make to the Windows 365 app and that experience to connect to your cloud PC. So, Scott, why don't you why don't you show us what's to come then for the new Windows 365 app and how that works with Windows 11 as well as Windows 10? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. So as you saw earlier, we're bringing the Windows 365 experience natively into Windows 11. You saw that through the task view demo where I could click on the task view and switch in between it. But we're also building in a native Windows 365 uh, cloud PC application. This application is an exact replica of how the experience works from the cloud, and you'll see some demos of this uh, in, in later on throughout this session. When I mean through the cloud, I mean through the browser. So our browser experience and our native experiences on all platforms have a very consistent look and feel and bring forward all the power 
that we provide to end users to have an experience more consistent with the physical world. And again, Windows 365 was built to not require training for your admins or training for your end users. So this application, again, requires no configuration or management. You simply log in with your AAD credentials. We discover your cloud PCs. And it has this really rich first run experience to help guide the user and orient them to this application. Let me show you a quick demo of how this will look. So if I go to the start menu, I can launch the application built natively into Windows 11 and is available as a download for Windows 10. Being this is the first time I've run it, it walks me through the first run experience. It tells me a little bit about what to expect when I'm using my cloud PC. It shows me how the tile works. Uh, it shows me what's required for me to get uh, access to this. And then talks about how simple it is to launch your both Windows 11 and Windows 10 experience. What I'm really excited about here is all these rich capabilities that a user has with their cloud PC to be able to restart it, resize it, restore it back to a previous state is available right here within the client application. And then simply clicking on the tile takes me straight back to that personal desktop that's always available just waiting for me. Now you've seen this demo now as I've moved from booting directly into my cloud PC experience with a new Windows 11 device. You've seen how I've integrated in this fast switch with my own personal device moving between it and perhaps a corporate provided device where the Windows 11 uh, cloud PC experience is built right into the shell. All of these provide a very consistent way for users to get access and each of these could have been a different machine in a different place in the globe and allowing me to continue to get right back to that same Windows 365 cloud PC. We talk about Windows 365 is available on any device, anytime, anywhere. It's your personal desktop delivered from the cloud. Thank you so much, Scott, for, for really giving us kind of the lay of the land as to what Windows 365 is, some of the capabilities that we have across business and enterprise, some of the, the new capabilities to come, and also what's coming in the app. I think now is a good time, though, that we transition really to some of the admin topics. And for that, I'm joined by, again, by Christian Brinkhoff, who's you know been behind a lot of the, you know, a lot of the design, the specifications, kind of the capabilities for admins. So again, thank you, Scott. And why don't we move over to Christian? We've got a lot more, a uh, lot more things to present and a lot more kind of depth to go into in the next hour and a half. Here, th thanks, Jeremy. And it's it's always great to uh, to work and present with you and Scott as well, because it really creates the, the like connection between what we can do for business as well as technically and we all have like deep technical knowledge because we all have the engineering passion in mind and that really represents this event like you get a quick intro kind of the vision of the the service moving forward and right now we are jumping into the how to what do you need to implement windows 365 enterprise or business and how do you implement it so we will walk you through the prerequisites as well as the demos how you can implement it yourself and i have jeremy here that can keep me honest and uh, ask some questions as well that you point in the chat live here so it represents sort of the scenario and the questions you have uh, too so let's uh, let's get started yeah my so favorite topic is deployment that's why i've got deploy in my twitter handle and everything else so would love to go through like what's the initial provisioning process look like and what does one you know, somebody need to do to get everything up and running yeah exactly and let's start with the deployment process so what you see on the screen here is really what you have to do to deploy windows 365 per a domain scenario so as you heard from scott and from jeremy in this previous presentation uh, we now support azure ad join which means that you no longer need to bring in an Azure subscription, a VNet, and all kinds of uh, on-premises services to use Windows 365. So right now we have the option still to use hybrid Azure AD join, meaning that if you still have the need for Kerberos domain for applications that require Kerberos to authenticate to or any other reason you have in your environment, we still support that. However, that still requires an Azure subscription uh, some uh, some some resources to connect to that Azure subscription, meaning a VNet and domain controller potentially in Azure or on-prem via site to site or express route, and of course configuration of hybrid Azure AD join. So that is what we released in um, August in GA last year. What uh, Satya did announce during Microsoft Inspire, and the other great thing that we just released like a month or one and a half ago and it will soon go into GA as Azure AD join. And with Azure AD join, 
you can go full cloud. So no need, as I said before, for an Azure subscription, Kerberos, domain controller, uh, VNet configurations and such. So you can go full cloud, no need for an on-premises network connection, meaning that you can just uh, yeah, purchase a license, create a provisioning policy in the enterprise product, and that's all you need to do. And then you're good to go and you can just provision a cloud PC from there without any on-premises infrastructure or needs to do something first in order to provision a cloud PC. So that's a game changing um, configuration flow because there's no other product in market that can do it so simple from within the Microsoft Endpoint Manager console for the Windows 365 Enterprise product. Then we have the Windows 365 a business product and that has been from the start already with that experience so you only had to and still have to of course provision a, a cloud pc via just attaching a license to a user and then you're good to go so that already has that mindset of just simple very very fast uh, in terms of getting productive and and such so uh, scott just presented the differences between the enterprise and business product and from the business product you really have a solution for small, medium businesses now that can enable you for hybrid remote work from any device without any complexity of any previous virtualization technology in market. So we'll, we'll game change in turnkey solutions that we have. And just to serve your needs, you can do hybrid and as well Azure AD. So um, wherever you are in your journey to Azure AD, join like native Azure AD. We serve you where you are today or perhaps are uh, tomorrow. Why don't we okay. dig a bit more in on the identity? Because I think this is one of the things, just, just to lighten this up a little bit, I've been bugging the team in terms of uh, Azure Virtual Desktop and Windows 365 for years, waiting for this capability. So it's good that we have it now, and it's something that I'm super excited for. So why don't you kind of go through that a little bit more in terms of you know what you can do through Azure AD Join and what you can do now uh, if you still want to have hybrid Azure AD Join available? Yeah, exactly. So we can be very simple and straightforward on the explanation how you do the configuration of Azure AD. So if you have Azure AD join as a primary domain configuration in your environment, perhaps for your physical PCs, how you manage your physical PCs via Microsoft Endpoint Manager uh, with Azure AD configuration in place, you know you, you don't have to do any extra configuration or something like that on the domain level. So that's what you see on the left side here. On the right side, you see what if you want to continue or go hybrid Azure AD join. If you are coming from an on-premises environment and you haven't configured hybrid Azure AD join yet, or you're only using uh, Office 365 services and you want to go to Cloud PC and you still need a Kerberos domain controller, then you need to configure the hybrid Azure AD uh, join setting in the um, Active, uh, Azure Active Directory Connect setup, which you see on the right side here. So it could be that you currently have uh, a different configuration setup, but most likely you already are in a hybrid Azure AD join mode. So that's what you can see here. The easy way to configure that if you uh, need to, you have to go to your Azure AD Connect server environment, open that wizard once more, authenticate with your domain credentials, your administrator credentials, go through the setup, and then at device options, you can select the configure hybrid Azure AD join setting. Then just go to next, then it synchronizes once more, and then you're good to go as well. So pretty straightforward. Uh, easiest option is, of course, Azure AD join. Uh, business, enterprise, both support that. So wherever you are in that journey, you can you can use that. But if you want to go hybrid, you can do that, uh, do that too. And one thing to point out here is that from a networking perspective, if you're doing Azure AD join native, you can still get to on-premises resources, file shares, locally hosted apps, those kind of things. It's not an either or where maybe hybrid uh, Azure AD means that I can get to my on-prem. You can still do it even if you're doing native uh, Azure AD join. I think that's important because that means that you've got more flexibility in terms of, again, where you want to start. Do you want to have that, that connectivity back to your local domain? Do you still need to have access to those resources? So why don't we dig into some of the network options, requirements, and things that people can do to hook up their cloud PCs to their existing networks? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. And that's exactly true. Like with Azure Dejoin, we don't say, hey, you can only go full cloud and not connect to your on-premises environment. So we have something called in the enterprise product called uh, Azure Network Connection, uh, previously known as the on-premises network connection. And that can some that can be something you can configure for hybrid. And then it's a requirement 
for Azure AD join, it's an optional setting, but we still allow an IT admin to connect to their backend services, of course, because most likely in your cloud PC, you have applications next to Microsoft 365 apps, your own corporate corporate with an application that require a connection to the backend in your own Azure or on-premises private cloud data center. And we all support that. So that's not a limitation of Azure AD moving forward. So you have that flexibility, but the other option we have is that you can now for AGD join configure a hosted network, meaning that in that hosted environment that we manage uh, for you as a customer, um, as part of the SaaS software as a service solution, uh, we manage the VM objects and the platform capabilities for customers. We now also offer the capability to host the VNet uh, on behalf of the customer. And that creates that flexibility of hey, you can just hit provision, and then in a matter of 10, 15 minutes, you have a cloud PC, and you can just use it for connecting to your apps and Microsoft 365 uh, apps as well, uh, just from yeah, just from scratch to being productive in like 15 minutes or so. But if you want to go on-prem, you of course need to configure a little bit more to make sure that on-premises network connection is uh, in place. However, it could be that you already use Microsoft Azure services and therefore you already have an express route. And then that capability is just as well, just a flip of a switch because you already did that platform uh, capability and configuring those network uh, requirements in order to, uh, to connect to on-prem from your uh, cloud, uh, cloud PC environment. So in this list, you see a couple of uh, requirements in terms of uh, using uh, on-premises network connection and in the context of hybrid as well as an Azure AD. So you see that we support express route side to side VPN as part of a uh, backend connection uh, from within your cloud PC. And that is uh, both for uh, hybrid as well as Azure AD uh, for the enterprise product. Um, we, we support as well other capabilities like VNet peering, um, capabilities with like going from a vendor oriented solution. Uh, VPN uh, is also supported. So if you have a VPN on your endpoint, and you want to connect to the cloud PC or a VPN from within the cloud PC to your own environment, to uh, a private network of a vendor where you can connect to a specific app or a web application or an intranet, that's all supported as well. So um, be mindful how you configure it and if you uh, configure it well, because in the next couple of slides, I will show you as well some of the URLs you need to whitelist to uh, connect to the Windows 365 service. So that uh, is, is a capability you need to do uh, before you uh, provision the cloud PC, but I will share that in just, uh, just a bit. Um, if you go hybrid uh, with an own domain controller, you need to make sure that your um, Azure VNet can route to the DNS server, of course, because the cloud PC will be joined in your Kerberos domain. So of, of course, with Azure AD join, that's, that's not a problem, but if you go hybrid, make sure that a DNS server is close by or at least on a network level can connect from your VNet to your Kerberos domain and resolve the uh, domain records and everything. Uh, so that's a requirement there as well. As I said, you can continue to use your VPN solutions. So if you have any existing uh, Palo Alto, Zscaler kind of VPN solution, you can still uh, use that. Um, Azure AD must be in sync with AD. So if you have hybrid, make sure that that sync in place as previously shared in that screenshot. Make sure that that setting is in place correctly because that means that all the components as well as the computer objects are active in Azure AD. And of course, uh, the cloud PCs are joined to Active Directory. So that's one, one thing to keep in mind. One of the other things to keep in mind as well is that if you have the need for an on-premises network connection, make sure that on-premises network connection is in place in the region where you want to provision your cloud PCs in as well. Because what we will do if you use an on-premises network connection is that we make sure that that cloud PC is hosted in the same region as where your cloud, cloud PC, um, your virtual network is as where your cloud PC eventually will be. Meaning that we keep it close for the latency purpose as well as the direction where we want to uh, yeah, steer that provisioning in. So that's something you can uh, control yourself as well. If you go Azure AD join, you can just select the regions we support and then do it just uh, proactively from, uh, from the provisioning policy setup. And I will show you how that works uh, in just a bit as well. But if you do the on-premises network connection, uh, you need to make sure that that region of that on-premises network connection and all the other regions, perhaps if you are a global organization, have an 
uh, VNet and as well appearing or an on-premises network connection express route side to side in place uh, too. So hope that helps, gives a little bit more a deeper technical context of, hey, what are the capabilities? But as I said, most organizations are moving uh, to Azure AD join and therefore this is not required. Uh, however, we still support an on-premises network connection. So if we move forward, like if you configure an on-premises network connection, as I said earlier, you need to configure the DNS configuration settings. So what you see here on the screen is the network configuration of your VNet on the right side for a hybrid HVD join. So make sure that when you configure your, your environment and it is hybrid, that you set up your DNS servers as part of your VNet to your DNS servers on-premises or in the Azure cloud. It just needs to resolve the domain controller or the domain name, the Kerberos domain, in order to succeed in provisioning of the cloud PC. And on the left side, you see, of course, that Azure AD join uh, doesn't require that because everything just resolves up to Azure AD directly. All right, related to that, Christian, what about, um, you know, I think a lot of network admins who might be tuning in, they're going to start, start to see a ton of traffic to various you know, addresses, endpoints, URLs that they might want to block because it's like all of a sudden I'm hitting these different services. You mentioned earlier there are some um, endpoints and URLs that we need to make sure that are freed up. So what are the what are the things that we should pay attention to and also relay that information back to our, our network teams? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest, um, there are some team members on the call here that are more in the field and connect directly with customers. And the main like, I think in the top three, uh, troubleshooting errors and, and, and mistakes are around networking and onboarding to Windows 365. And one of the main reasons is, is that the URLs, the cloud URLs that we use to connect to uh, our Windows 365 services on the back end, uh, so Microsoft Endpoint Manager URLs, um, potentially Office 365 URLs, as well as the AVD control plane URLs, all those URLs need to be uh, yeah, accessible from within your, um, your Azure environment if you connect to on-premises as well as have the need to connect to your backend, as well as from the uh, endpoint side. So connect to the service is required as well to at least have 443 to a couple of URLs open. And most likely that's all working because that comes from outside to inside. But if you have back and forth communication coming in, then uh, URLs need to be whitelisted. And we have a great like documentation uh, page for this, which lists all the URLs you need to whitelist. So you see that on the screen here too. So most, most of the traffic is all going outbound. So no really need to, to, to open up URLs specifically if you have all URLs supported, but outbound um, uh, supported as well, port 80 or 443, that's most of the ports we use. Uh, but there are some specific URLs as well to uh, to whitelist, and you can all find it on the aka.ms slash w365urls page. And on the aka.ms slash memurls, you find the specific memurls that we need to whitelist mem access, like connecting to the mem backend and doing application delivery rules and uh, endpoint analytics, uh, monitoring actions, telemetry data that gets in and out. That, that needs to be whitelisted, of course, uh, too. And, and related to this, Christian, I think the question I get probably more than any other question is, does this use RDP port 3389 or you know SSH 22? Do I need to worry about leaving those ports open because it is a security vulnerability? So how does the connectivity back and forth work and is everything encrypted? Yeah, that's a great question. And if you are interested in diving even deeper than the content we have right now, uh, the last presentation is exactly around like networking flow architecture. How are the components defined per what Microsoft manages, what uh, the customer manager slash the partner? So I really encourage you to stay on till the end of this uh, this session. In the third session of this Windows 365 Accelerator, I will mention it deeply. Uh, but uh, just to give you a sneak peek, RDP is the protocol being used, but we leverage 443. Uh, so not not like the unsecure 3389 port that we know from 30 years ago from terminal server NT4. So we optimize the RDP protocol to go full 443, currently over TCP, but shortly as well over UDP. So we optimize the uh, protocol even to uh, like high latency connectivity um, you know, scenarios when you're more in the field or 
um, more living in a, a country that doesn't have a good infrastructure, uh, we solve that for you as well soon. So. Cool. All right. So what's the what's the licensing then? The requirements for getting everything configured and making sure that people have what they need? Because I know there's a probably a cloud PC component and also a Microsoft 365 component, right? Yeah, correct. So. Uh, for the Windows 365 business product, there's no need for um, Microsoft Endpoint Manager. So what does that mean? You just have to purchase a Windows 365 license and then you can provision a cloud PC and then you're good to go. So no need for uh, Intune or whatsoever if your organization doesn't use Intune. However, if we look at the enterprise product and most enterprise customer scenarios, you most likely already have Microsoft 365 E3 or E5. And that already includes Microsoft Intune or EMS, for example. Uh, so that's the prerequisite for, for the enterprise product because we use Microsoft Endpoint Manager for, uh, for the configuration and the provisioning and everything, as I said earlier, and I will show you that in, uh, in just a bit as well. But for both products, the licenses are equal. So you have the same set of licenses as well as the recommended apps or the supported example scenarios. They are equal for business and for, for enterprise. So we have a different set of variety, of course, RAM as well as operating system disk size that you can find in the admin.microsoft.com portal. So it's just the same portal you use so to configure and purchase Office 365 licenses. So it's very straightforward and in sync with other Microsoft SaaS products in, the, in market. So you just pick your license. One thing you really need to do before you purchase the license is to find uh, whether that's a setup that VM and operating system disk size fits to the need of your user. So what you can do as an easy transition is reflect the current environment, how the configuration is there uh, from a physical PC to a cloud PC, test it with one user and then just give a thumbs up if the performance is great and then uh, purchase all the other licenses as well. But always recommend because every customer is different per uh, kind of applications to uh, to test the environment and the license that you use yourself. But we have some uh, guidance here that we uh, tested as part of our uh, yeah, early testing, which we do on the back, back end as part of the SaaS service to optimize and test our licenses for uh, yeah, desktop scenarios. So we have specific SKUs and configurations customly made for Windows 365 that represent a desktop Windows 10 and Windows 11 full desktop uh, persistent uh, personalized uh, Windows experience. So uh, think about like two four is more lightweight kind of office worker scenarios. But if you go more to the uh, two core eight uh, gig of RAM and 16 and 32, you go more into beefier kind of power user machines. And then the 8-core 32 gig of RAM machine has as well that new nested virtualization capability. So you can run Linux on that, as well as Hyper-V, uh, all kinds of like sandbox or Docker kind of solutions that require nested virtualization are supported on that operating, um, on that, um, uh, operating system configuration license version. So 8-core 32 gig. And we are currently working on the background to investigate if we can uh, support four core and 16 gig of RAM as well for nested virtualization. So what about you have a license and you change from work um, like responsibilities, like you all of a sudden get Adobe Photoshop as an app because you are becoming a designer and you previously didn't do that before, but you only purchased your license. Uh, so a great feature we have for that is the resize feature. So in the resize feature in the Microsoft Endpoint Manager console, you can upgrade from like 2.8 uh, to 416, like four core 16 gig of RAM in terms of your license. And the only thing that happens on the background is that your uh, cloud PC will reboot and then you're having that like, like more resources license attached to your cloud PC and you don't lose any data for that as well. So that's a great feature to make sure that your productivity is continuing uh, moving uh, moving forward without any data loss and you have that flexibility to do that. And we are currently working as well to make that more flexible uh, for perhaps a user in the future. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. Once we uh, once we announce that, you will find it on our public facing roadmap that Scott shared before. But we are working on some improvements as well. So what does that mean? You can as well in the future downsize from licenses as well as change the operating system disk size back and forth. So all kinds of 
uh, supportability features and improvements to the resize feature. And one ask we received as well from customers is what about like bulk amounts of resize actions? Like what if you have a full department that all of a sudden needs uh, Adobe Photoshop? You can in the future as well do like a full department up to like a different license and then the same action will happen there as well just to make it easier to uh, to do that action on a bulk manner. So all kinds of flexibility that you have as part of the service just to take away the kind of complexity for an IT admin as well as perhaps an HR person to do the resize. Um, so no need to to test a different SKU on Azure, see if that performance is doing well and all those like complexity that you have in a virtualized environment on premises. This is all you know, pretty straightforward and easy to uh, to use and, and, and resize in your environment. So from a provisioning policy perspective, these are the things that are actually getting the cloud PCs in a state of the configured state so that you can push them out to the various users, right? So what are what are some of the elements to know about provisioning? Yes, that's that's a great question. And as I said before, like we, we covered licenses, domain congregation, and 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 what what kind of prerequisites you need on the networking side if you have any. Uh, so now we can really start with like the creation of the cloud PC. So uh, the provisioning process is very important because the provisioning process determines whether you use uh, Windows 10 or Windows 11, which language you use as part of your cloud PC, and all kinds of fundamental steps to. Yeah, configure that cloud PC. And the great thing about a provisioning policy is as well, once you're done and you define it in a way that you can reuse it for the de for department or location, you can attach it to an Azure AD group and you can make that Azure AD group like department, location. And if there are more people in the department and they have a license for Windows 365, you can just add that user to that Azure AD group and then the cloud PC is automatically starting to provision. So this Creation of the policy is really a one-time effort, and then you're good to go for the future to expand to uh, to that environment as well. And what you can do as well is attach that Azure AD group to a license. So what then happens is if you are an HR person and you add a user into an Azure AD group, then the license as well as the Cloud PC gets provisioned just straight away. So in 10, 15 minutes, your Cloud PC will be ready. And there is no real like provisioning policy configuration or MEM activity happening. So you can just streamline that process for your end users as well as for your HR people. And you can even add like service now as a partner to it to make it even more easier and combine it with other HR specific systems in your environment. So here you see a quick run through. So um, in the MEM portal, you see uh, in devices, Windows 365, and from there you can go to provisioning policies in the provisioning uh, section of the menu of uh, my, Windows 365. And I will show you that in a bit as well. And then you can just create a policy given a name, a type of domain, so uh, hybrid or Azure AD join, the location of your network, the configuration of your network, the uh, localized settings, so you can uh, select which language in the Cloud PC needs to be configured as well as the image, um, so Windows 10 and Windows 11. And after that, you're just done and have to configure that Azure AD, Azure AD group. So one thing I would like to show real quick as well, and I will do that just, just in a bit in a demo too, is after you configured your, um, your provisioning policy, everything starts to provision, but before you do that, you still have that option to configure a network connection. And what you see on the screen here is the difference between uh, whether you are going Azure AD join or hybrid Azure AD join. And with a network connection, we keep that network connection uh, in the portal and we keep that sort of in sync with the kind of quality level as well as the uh, telemetry we collect to make sure that that connection is in shape to connect to Windows 365 and as well allow users to connect to Windows 365. So what does that mean? If you have Azure AD join and the need for an on-premises network connection, um, you configure that to your uh, Azure VNet with your Express Route and side to side VPN. And on the background, we do some, some checks on that environment, meaning that we check the Azure subscription, we check how many IP addresses you have available in your VNet, we check as well the URLs. So, as I shared earlier, the cloud URLs we use for MEM and for Windows 365, and as well as some of the AVD backend services we leverage, uh, we, we sort of 
do a check, a, a port check as well as a URL check, whether the network that you use, if you route it to your own firewall, is allowed to, to connect to, to the Cloud PC services on the back end. So you see that green checkbox pass, so that means everything is good. If it's like blocked for like a port, 443 or port 80 or something like that, we will show that and as well give you the proper information to fix it. And for the hybrid SUD join, we do exactly the same, but you see a little bit more uh, yeah, lines in the check names because of course you have a domain controller. So we check as well whether you can resolve DNS or the domain controller, whether it's like, like reactive or responsive to, uh, to, the, to the network level uh, that it requires uh, to, uh, to have to join the cloud PCs to the, compu to the computer uh, as a computer account to the Active Directory domain as well. So all kinds of capabilities that belong to a SaaS service to release an IT admin from the extra knowledge that is required to configure a, a, a solution to enable hybrid remote work at Windows 365 does. So no need for complexity or uh, constantly checking with a known monitoring solution. We bake that into our service moving, uh, moving forward. And we have more of those uh, checks that proactively can uh, alert an IT admin coming up as well in endpoint analytics. So for example, if you have a, a connectivity error in your environment, it uh, sends an email or an SMS to the IT admin saying, hey, you need to uh, either wake up or stop drinking what you're drinking right now because you need to fix something before users can, uh, can start or recognize any errors in your environment. And I have some slides on that later on as well. Okay, so now you've got the, the cloud PC spun up. You've made sure the network connections are healthy so they can get to the services they need to and join the domain if they need to. So what does the user experience look like? What can they do? Yeah, so as you saw with the previous presentation, we are working hard on merging the experiences into Windows 11. So you will soon see more in Windows 11 client experiences that you previously had to download separately and go like via different routes as an end user to connect to your resources. So with the uh, web application, which we have which we have today, which is identical to our service, you can connect to Windows 365 from any device. So any device that supports an HTML5 browser supports uh, the Windows 365.microsoft.com portal. So if you go to Windows 365.microsoft.com, we have an own unique portal domain name and uh, and use experience in there that is identical to Windows 365. So what you see on the right side here is the uh, end user cards. So you see a rep representation of the cloud PC. So how, how many cores you have? What is the uh, amount of RAM? What is the storage size? You see as well when you connected last time to your cloud PC. And one of the quick sneak peeks you see here as well is that we are internally working on GPU uh, SKUs as well. It was one of the questions that came into the chat. So we are actively working on that and the timeline is TBD, but uh, when that is uh, more accurate, we will share that with you as well. Other great capabilities of this portal, what you will get in the Windows client as well, the Windows 365 app that Scott just uh, presented too, is the capabilities to do self-service uh, user actions. So you can do a restart or reset or rename or troubleshooting or any of the point in time restore features that we have today as well directly from the end user perspective. So you can do a reboot, of course, because yeah, you cannot connect to your cloud PC for any other reason. So you reboot, you just do a power switch and then you're good to go. But as well, reset, resetting your profile to the uh, factory default, for example, rename your cloud PC, uh, restore it to three, three, four days back because you had an issue with an application or you did developer work and you need to revert to three days back because your code was looking better three days before than it was today. That's all uh, supported as an end user. And for point in time restore, we can as well allow an end user to, um, or an IT admin to not allow an end user to show it. So all kinds of flexibility there to make sure that the IT admin is still in control of any of those, uh, those settings too. I'd love to see some of this stuff working. Do you have some demos for us, Christian? Yes, of course I have. So I came from like fertilization technologies from the past and I've seen, seen coming those solutions from a long way into Microsoft and it's just great to be able to improve a service as well as work together with a great great team uh, of, of, of like-minded people to solve challenges we had for the last 30 days. 
uh, into Windows directly, as well as the simplification of the setup of, of the product. So what you see here is just the first step. You purchase a license. So just straightforward, you go to admin.microsoft.com and you go to purchase services, and then you search for Windows 365. And in here, you see Windows 365 Business and Enterprise. So one remark here is that the one core license is not available anymore. So you cannot purchase that anymore, uh, but you need to purchase the two for Ohio license, and this is for business. And for enterprise, you can easily find it on the right side. And for, uh, for the business product, if you have software assurance or any other license for Windows 11 or Windows, uh, Windows 10, you can go for the hybrid, uh, hybrid use uh, benefit program as well, and that gives you an extra discount on uh, the Cloud PC license because the Windows license is, uh, is already paid. So uh, be mindful if you go down, uh, down that uh, route as well, that there are some benefits on the licensing side. So with that, uh, we did the pre wac on the license. So pretty straightforward for the business product. This is kind of the only thing you need to do. So uh, business product, just purchase the license, assign it to a user or an IT group, and then the Cloud PC starts to provision. I have a demo on that later on as well, on, on a couple of those IT admin capabilities we just released as well to improve the kind of admin capabilities you have for even a simple product like Windows 365 business. But right now I would like to really show what the provisioning process is for Windows 365 Enterprise when you already purchased the license and you go fully Azure AD joined as part of your Cloud PC domain configuration. So what you see here is what I just shared before, the Windows 365 uh, yeah, blade, the console that we have inside Microsoft Endpoint Manager. So you see under devices, Windows 365, uh, provisioning policies, but all kinds of other settings as well, like all cloud, cloud PCs, custom images, on-premises network connection, which is now named as uh, Azure Network Connection, by the way. It's the same uh, options and configuration flow, but just the name has, uh, has, has gone to a name change. Um, but custom images is a quick one to remark. Um, you can, like, if you have like an on-premises, like VDI technology environment, and you want to switch to Windows 365, you can just drag and drop that image into Azure and just reuse it as a custom image as part of your Cloud PC environment. So if you think you have to build your full images up from scratch in order to go to Windows 365, uh, the answer to that is no, because we support custom images as well. So if you sysprep your image, or you have already a sysprepped image, you can, you can just import it here into the custom images menu, and then you will see it as part of your provisioning policy configuration. Um, i uh, going to start in uh, in just a couple of seconds here. So here you see the creation of the provisioning policy. So I, I given a name of, of that could be a random name or department slash location. Here you define the uh, jo domain join type. And if you go actually join and then hosted network as the SaaS solution, as I explained earlier, you can just select the region you want to provision. And that's all you need to do. So no need for any prerequisites, as I said earlier. If you want to go to an on-premises connection, you need to select as network the other option, uh, on-premises uh, like network connection, the, the Azure network connection, and then you make sure that you can connect from that cloud PC to your on-premises environment. So that's all very straightforward and easy to, uh, to do, and all that flexibility in between uh, going full cloud as well as on-premises is possible uh, to, uh, to do here. So after that, you go through the, uh, the setting here, and that setting it gives you uh, gives you the uh, capabilities of uh, configuring an image, as you can see on the on the right side, section number two. So you define there the Windows 10 or Windows 11 imagery support. The configuration supports uh, the localized experience, meaning that you can configure your um, your language packs and your keyboard settings that represent the language you configure there. Assignments is the Azure AD group. So as I defined or said earlier, if you have an Azure AD group that belongs to a cer certain department and you configure the license as well as the uh, provisioning policy to that, then, then you're good to go and can just straight add that user into that Azure AD group and then you're good to go. And then after that, you review, create the, uh, the provisioning policy and then you're, you're good to go. And after the configuration is done, like 10, 15 minutes or so, uh, you are able to log on as an end user 
to the windows365.microsoft.com portal. So what you see here is a demo of an end user using the uh, windows365.microsoft.com portal with the new web portal experience that Scott just uh, presented as well at the roadmap slide. So you give him the credentials here and then you're good to go. And we are working, by the way, on single sign-on support for that secondary authentication level you just saw on the screen. So this is very straightforward. You just log on and you have your Windows 11 Cloud PC ready for you from any device. This, this even supports Linux, for example. If you have Linux and you have an HTML5 browser on that endpoint, you can support that as well from, uh, from there. And we have partners as well that support Linux if you have a requirement for that. Uh, but of course, we have clients for Android, um, Mac OS. Uh, on an iPhone, you can launch a Windows 365 session. And even on a Surface Duo 2 or any other Windows device, of course, that we, uh, that we support today. Okay, so those are the enterprise experiences. What does the business experience look like for smaller or medium businesses, up to 300 seats? Yeah, let's switch to the business product. So I already explained a little bit like Windows 365 business is as easy as just assigning a license. So I'm skipping the license purchase flow because I already showed it to you. So what I really would like to show is the IT admin experiences that we released last December uh, to make it easier for an uh, accidental admin, like somebody in a small medium business organization, probably doesn't have like deep knowledge of Microsoft Endpoint Manager. So what we did is built in the uh, business product some of the capabilities we have for the enterprise product as well to just make it easier. So for example, you can now select a, a account type, the rights that you set per user to standard or local admin, or you can change the uh, Windows version that is being provisioned for the Cloud PC for the business product. So for example, if you go into the uh, windows365.microsoft.com portal and you use a Windows 365 uh, business license and you have extra uh, admin capabilities, you will see this organization set up. And then when, once you have already Cloud PCs provision because you attach the license to a user and you want to change that, you can just go in, change this setting, do a reprovision if you um, change the operating system uh, version and then you're good to go. So pretty straightforward, easy, and we are continuing the add of some of the capabilities of the enterprise product in a more simplified manner without the Microsoft Endpoint Manager uh, configuration flow. So for example, the uh, localized settings, the uh, language of the Cloud PC and such will be will be integrated into this flow uh, pretty soon as, as well, and some more capabilities as well coming up. So one thing uh, you can do as well now in the uh, business product is uh, manage Cloud PCs uh, on behalf of. So if you are an accidental IT admin in the uh, business product, you can find the Cloud PCs that are active and you can do a restart or change uh, the standard account settings individually per Cloud PC user as well. So you just need to change it and at that time, the action is taking effect on that Cloud PC, so it does a reboot and some 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 um, some code actions on the background, and then you're you're good to go. And you can do the same thing for resetting the Cloud PC as well as restarting the Cloud PC. So if you are, for example, an office manager in a small medium business organization, and you have like ten or fifteen Cloud PC business Cloud PCs and you need to just reboot it because uh, somebody is on the road and he cannot like work or log onto his cloud PC, that person can just call the office manager and the office manager knows exactly what to do in this simplified console. And then after that, um, yeah, everything starts to light up and work again. And if things are not working fine, you can always hit the reset button and then you get a just new cloud PC provision with all the capabilities we have baked in. Uh, Microsoft 365 apps and OneDrive, uh, yeah, automatically recovering your user data inside the Cloud PC uh, as uh, as well. And you mentioned also earlier a lot of the updates that are coming for Microsoft Teams because from a networking perspective, I think, and encoding decoding perspective, Teams is a fairly expensive workload on a hosted a Cloud PC. So, what are some of the updates there? What does that look like? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. And um, Teams, as Scott was saying before, we are nearing closer and closer the the gap between Teams on a physical PC 
as well as teams in our virtual cloud PC session. So as some of the folks on this call probably know, we use a uh, WebRTC uh, plugin optimization manner to redirect the traffic that happens in a virtual session somewhere 100 miles away in a different Azure data center uh, to your local PC. So we sort of use a, a API direction that makes it possible to do a peer-to-peer -peer from the endpoint to the other person, whether it's on a physical or on a cloud PC or any other virtualized uh, technology that is being used. And that creates a better video experience. And as part of those experiences, we are improving the features as well, narrowing that gap. And what you see here that is coming up very soon is a background blur support for Teams. So this is coming very, very soon. Uh, I cannot share exactly when, but like think, think in like not in in months, but but perhaps in uh, perhaps in in days. And this is very exciting because I have seen people working on a, a, a cloud PC when we didn't have this feature, uh, when the background of of their office, their home office, was not not so clean. So this would probably be a very well appreciated feature for those uh, those folks as well. So coming soon, as well as custom uh, backgrounds uh, are coming soon as well. And some of the other capabilities that Scott just shared are part of that bigger uh, kind of announcement we will do pretty uh, pretty soon. Nice. So let's move on to point in time restore. Just in case you need to go back to a previous configuration or previous state, uh, how does that work? Yeah. So point in time restore is really a feature that represents kind of the connection we have with a physical PC, meaning that if you are using a physical physical PC, it could be that you sometimes have to restore uh, to a previous point in time, or you just you lost some data. And of course, with OneDrive. Um, we will capture like revisions of the data and you can just go to the recycling bin and restore it. So for those use cases, probably the point in time restore feature is not really necessary. But if you are like doing something in your cloud PC that uh, creates um, like some damage in the operating system or there is something else happening, as I said before, you're doing code, uh, doing some scripting and you lost your script and you stored it on a location that is not captured by uh, a OneDrive, for example, then this feature could be great, but as well for uh, BCDR uh, purposes. So if you need to restore to to another like location, you can use those snapshots uh, as well. And we are constantly improving the BCDR like strategy and technology capabilities we have. And there was a question in the chat as well, like what are you guys doing on replicating the cloud PC if you are on the road and go from like the US to uh, like West Europe, for example. So we are currently investigating the kind of capabilities we can build bake in, baked into our surface. So stay tuned for the roadmap as well to uh, to see more insights on where, where we are with those uh, those features. But I really would like to show you the point in time restore feature from an IT admin perspective. So what you see here is the same console I just shared where you can provision a cloud PC, but in the user settings, you can activate the point in time restore feature for the enterprise product. So if you go to add and you already see some existing ones here, but if you want to create a new one, you click on add, but let, let me show you how you can modify an existing one. And here you can define the frequency of the restore points as well as allow a user to do the restore. So as I said earlier, you can allow a user to do it themselves from the uh, end user portal. So that's all capabilities you can um, bring and uh, hide for an IT, IT, uh, or from an IT admin for an end user. And if you do that, you can switch to the user account and then go to that windows365.microsoft.com portal. And here you can define uh, how how much time or what what restore point what snapshot point you want to go back to, and then if you click on restore, it does a reboot and restores that uh, cloud PC to the previous point uh, point in time. So pretty straightforward, very easy, and all free of charge because it's baked into the existing license. So cool. And one of the one of the exciting things I think with nested virtualization support that we're moving to now is it gives you that access to Windows subsystem for Linux. So, you know, for your for your daily driver normal machine, if you're in, administering Linux boxes and you need to uh, access some of the some of the service for those services for those, you can do that as well as even uh, the Android experiences that are that are coming up. So, why don't we talk through uh, nested virtualization support? Yeah, so yeah. as I said earlier in the licensing slide, uh, the nested virtualization feature highlighted here in tick letters 
is something we support on the eight core 32 gig of light uh, of, of ram license so uh, we are working on getting it into the four core uh, but we really think that the eight core 32 is a sweet spot because as you probably know yourself if you run hyper v and you want to run another windows machine on another windows machine you require sort of a duplicated kind of uh, resource amount that you have on that local VM and perhaps if you want to run a little bit more machines, you need more resources and power as well. So for running Hyper-V, we think 8-Core is, is the great license uh, to uh, to use uh, for doing those developer kind of scenarios. But uh, WSL and uh, WSA and uh, Sandbox and Docker are kind of services we support uh, too. And this is an example of using uh, Windows 365 uh, with Linux in inside the Windows 365 Cloud PC. So if you're a developer and you have nested virtualization activated, you can just install uh, WSL. And if you do that from a Windows feature perspective, you can go into the Microsoft Store and download Ubuntu. And then after that, it installs Ubuntu inside Windows 11, which is kind of amazing uh, running Linux on a Windows operating system. We have we have imagined that like 20, 30 years ago. So the world changes, and there's all kinds of flexibility possible between switching operating systems and using Windows uh, in conjunction with Linux uh, in a cloud PC on any device. So this creates sort of the flexibility developers really want today for hybrid remote, remote work scenarios. Like a developer can be on the road as well or have a remote office and an office at, at work. And that flexibility between hey, I have a device that is always online and I can just log on to and continue my work from my phone or from my laptop. That's really where, where this product really comes to, uh, to life with the simplification, as well as the developer tools we support as part of Windows 365. Cool, so for all the partners who are watching, what does their experience look like then if they've got a few different clients that they're managing? Yeah, it's, it's great to share as well that uh, Windows uh, 365 now supports uh, Microsoft 365 Lighthouse. So what does that mean? So um, to be frank and transparent, uh, virtualization technologies um, haven't always been good for partners to manage on a multi-tenant basis. So a game changer is that Microsoft 365 Lighthouse is a Microsoft product that makes it possible to manage multiple customers as a partner at the same time or one partner that does multiple partners at the same time. So you can use the Microsoft 365 Lighthouse portal to see all your uh, Cloud PC tenant environments and as well the status of that, like the, the network connection statuses, the provisioning uh, statuses, the Cloud PCs, as well as the Microsoft Endpoint Manager console, all those capabilities are they are baked into one single point of, uh, point of um, um, pane of glass. And from there you can just manage that that environment per customer so i will show you show you that just in a bit but one of the capabilities to mention here is that you can do like security management like defender threat management protection from that same console as well so the great thing just to re remark that is like just have one console and manage all those environments at the same time without any extra license or whatsoever, because Microsoft 365 at Lighthouse is something you can just uh, use uh, right now. So here you see that console. So let me uh, let me start the demo real quick. Um, so here you see the Microsoft 365 Lighthouse portal and all the tenants I'm uh, managing here. So you see all the customer environments. So you see um, some examples like, of course, Contoso. And if you switch that, you see the status of the Cloud PC environment from here. So you can see, for example, whether the uh, Contoso tenant has some provisioning issues, how many Cloud PCs are in that environment. And if you double double click on, on one of those Cloud PC, uh, Cloud PC messages here, you can see the status of that. And if you click on the view tenant provisioning policies, you re redirect directly to the Microsoft Endpoint Manager environment as well. So all kinds of partner capabilities we didn't offer before that are now available today in GA that support Windows 365. So that's great news and creates like, like lots of new partner capabilities to resell Windows 365 with some benefits from one of the CSP channels and other partner benefits we have, and also from the management layer to do it on a multi-tenant basis today, so. Cool, so why don't we move on to another theme? I think that's, um... Always a question, especially when you're thinking about hosted cloud PCs. Uh, do I bake the applications into a custom image 
or do I deliver them because they're long running PCs through my normal processes with tools like Mem, Intune, Config Manager? What what what's our story there? What's what's the best way to deliver apps and manage them? Yeah, it's a good question. And of course, if you're like a virtualization customer, you have most likely built built like golden images and we don't believe really that that's the future. It's very inefficient. And what we believe in is that you have a clean image that we as part of Microsoft always keep up to date for you. And you layer your customizations, your policies, your applications on top of that in a manner that if you reprovision a cloud PC or expand to multiple, that you can just flip the underlying, underlying operating system from it and then provision just a new operating system version while still have your applications attached separately. And if you add a new application, you only need to add that new application to your environment. So what you see here, if you are, for example, a physical PC customer and use MEM, you can also just go into your existing applications and then just add the scope of where that application needs to be installed to, and then add your Azure AD group, and then that application will automatically enroll to your Cloud PC environment without a reboot or reprovisioning the Cloud PC or things, uh, things like that. So it's very straightforward and easy and very efficient as well if you are an existing customer uh, for physical PCs and using, uh, using MAM. Okay, so back to the enterprise kind of themes in terms of uh, different roles and responsibilities and making sure that you have just enough access uh, so people don't do things they shouldn't be doing necessarily. What does that look like in terms of how you can how you can distribute various privilege levels across the service? Yeah, the great thing about Mike's event point manager is that you have all kinds of build and roles already that can make it easier for IT admins to delegate actions and responsibilities to uh, service desk members as well as IT admins that have different responsibilities in the team. So what you see here are, are the RBAC roles that we have and support as part of Windows 365. So you can just configure that and then uh, you get that role assigned to that IT admin and that makes it possible to just give a certain set of delegated access in the environment to that end user uh, IT admin to uh, to do to make sure that your environment keeps uh, keeps clean uh, in a large enterprise environment it's always hard to uh, to yeah to give everybody the same set of rights and make sure that nobody is uh, changing some buttons and whistles in the environment and this really would would help in controlling that access and make sure that everything keeps clean uh, from moving forward and Talking about keeping clean and moving forward from an IT admin perspective, as I said earlier, we are working currently on making new, more alerting capabilities and endpoint analytics available. So uh, delegated access is one of those capabilities to control proactively to make sure that people cannot control things that they should not do. But from an endpoint analytics support, support perspective, we are working on, of course, today we have like um, round trip time support and resource allocation and all kinds of great features. But in the future, we will needlessly integrate those capabilities like remoting a rounded time latency and bandwidth that is required to use. And if it's still in a good shape, directly inside the Microsoft Endpoint Manager Admin Center from devices in the console, you will see the remoting history and all kinds of Cloud PC capabilities next to uh, like normal capabilities you normally see when you have a physical PC in uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And the other great capability is that from uh, the alerting menu, you can as well click in the future uh, for a specific Cloud PC element. So uh, for example, you have an on-premises network connection uh, as part of your hybrid or Azure AD joint configuration, and there's something wrong with your express route. You can in the future create an alert that if there's a metric hit of that provisioning status because there's no on on-premises network connection, it, it it gives the IT admin an, an alert uh, via an email, for example, that can wake him up in the middle of the night or just uh, just in a, in a, on a working working hour day, daily basis, and then he or she knows, um, yeah, I need to do something, right? So there are all kinds of new capabilities to make that monitoring capability set more. Um, uh, yeah, more more like expensive and more um, aligning with scenarios we want to support where customers are and moving up to a SaaS solution like Windows uh, Windows 365. Cool. So a ton of ton of exciting things to come. I think we showed with Scott earlier in the in the day, and also how you can get everything provisioned and running, and even stay on top of services while they're running. 
So, Christian, I'm going to leave it to you now. I'm going to I'm going to sign off, and we're going to be in the very capable hands of Captain Brinkhoff to take us home with uh, some product tips and also some best practices for the last 30 or so minutes. So, thank you, Christian. Signing yeah. up. Thanks, Jeremy, for for joining. And uh, yeah, let's take it to the next level and dive a little bit deeper in some of the architecture best practices and capabilities you can configure with Windows 365 uh, and as well per different domain scenario we uh, we support. So in the next couple of slides, I will walk and guide you through some of the architectural concepts as well as some of the best practices of uh, troubleshooting and resizing and all those capabilities I just shared. So uh, yeah, sit back and relax and uh, see if, if th this is like touching kind of the elements you uh, want to know because if you start deploying Windows 365, yeah, I, I'm always like very passionate about learning exactly what to do before starting designing or executing. And this second or third part of this, this session is really a follow up to the second session that dives a little bit deeper into the, uh, the architectures. So what you see here is the first architecture uh, option uh, as part of Azure AD Join. So as I said earlier, Azure AD Join is fully cloud agnostic native Windows 365 without any requirements to connect to on-premises. So what does that mean? So what you see here on the screen are all kinds of layers that are uh, part of the SaaS solution, the offering that we do as Microsoft uh, as part of Windows 365. So you see that we leverage for the Windows 365 Enterprise product, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, Azure AD, the Azure subscription, virtual network, and the resor resources like the virtual machine and the, the virtual network are all hosted in a Microsoft managed environment. So you as a customer don't see anything uh, for, for that uh, management level uh, for, for doing that maintenance. So that's all part of the software as a service solution that we manage on behalf of the customer. And you see as well some of the, uh, the back, back, end, back, back end services we, uh, we, we use, like uh, the AVD brokering services on the right side. So the gateway diagnostic, all the services that you previously had to provision yourself, uh, that's something we have in the set software as a service solution. And you don't have to configure or see or do anything for that. That's all automated and baked into the service. So this is all hosted as you join without the on-premises network connection. So if you add the uh, connection level to uh, to this, that, that allows you to connect to on-premises. That makes it possible to uh, to uh, yeah connect to to on-premises resources. You will add that express route and and VNet connection to it. But I will show you that in just uh, just a bit. But here you see the narrows and the layers of uh, what is being managed by uh, the customer and as well the capabilities that we offer with a VPN client. Um, if you are a customer using a VPN client on your endpoint, uh, you can continue using that to connect to your Windows 365 environment from like a mobile phone or an iPad or a laptop. That's all supported. And you can do it even from within your cloud PC if you if you have to. So from this uh, from this setup, as I said earlier, uh, there are a couple of things to uh, uh, to keep in mind, so uh, everything is fully managed, so no need for an on-premises network connection and things like that. And we also support co-management, so if you are already in MEM and you have like MECM, previously known as CCM on-premises, uh, we support it as well, so you can match that configuration flow uh, if you if you have to. And all kinds of other capabilities uh, from like connecting to the on-premises environment are possible as well uh, in this in this configuration. So we really recommend customers if they can to configure uh, the Windows 365 enterprise product with Azure AD join. Uh, but of course, as I said earlier, if you can because you still have an on-premises requirement for uh, Kerberos, uh, you can go hybrid as well. And therefore, you need to bring in a little bit more capabilities for, um, yeah, for 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 configuring that uh, an Azure uh, the subscription and a VNet and and things uh, things like that too. And one thing to keep in mind as well is, as I said earlier, this managed configuration makes it possible as well to easily connect or create a cloud PC in a certain region that you can predefine in the provisioning policy configuration. And as part of that configuration. You can define a location that is closest to your physical location. 
So uh, what does that mean in terms of the end user experience? Is that that latency to that like physical data center is 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 the closest buyer that you can get from your physical location. And if you have an on-premises network connection and your data center is further away, this option with Azure G Join uh, creates a capability, an option for you to go closer to your physical location because we uh, support Windows 365 in almost every Azure data center right now. So you can just pick the closest Azure data center that is to you and then have a, a stable low latency connection to your, to your cloud PC environment. So then we have Azure AD join with the bring your own network capabilities. So that's what you see here on the screen. So same concept of components we use. And the difference is, is here that uh, some of the components are matching the uh, uh, like um, uh, customers Azure subscription environment because that connection to the backend services is required. So you see on the left side, the different colors of management level. And on top, you see again, Microsoft Envoy Manager, of course, and Azure AD. And you see that customer hosted environment and Microsoft hosted environment in the middle and underneath that. And that's sort of where we draw the line between Azure AD join as well as hybrid, which I'm going to show you in just a bit between, hey, OK, I want to go to my backend and that requires a subscription and the subscription needs to have a VNet and that VNet needs to have an, um, a site to site connection or an express route connection to on premises or any other SD-WAN or partner solution you use in your environment. And that creates a little bit more complexity, uh, like not, not to the level of configuring everything yourself with the network level and the maintenance on the network level is of course still something you or a partner that needs to do because the routing of the traffic remains to go to your own uh, firewall or own like network routing levels and equipment that you have in your environment. And that's to be frank, um, what most customers still want and use today. So what I will, uh, what I predict what, what will happen is that most customers will go Azure AD join, but still have the requirement to connect to on-premises data. And then the Azure AD join would bring your own network capabilities is the is the best pick for uh, for those customers moving and uh, moving forward. Other great things, as I just shared, is is supported too. So co-management can be possible. Um, keep in mind that that network connection you configure uh, and that VNet connection that determines where your cloud PC is created in. So if you have an on-premise network connection that sits in uh, central US, then the cloud PC will also be provisioned in the Microsoft managed environment in central US. So all kinds of capabilities um, you need to know about before you start kicking the tires uh, to determine whether your latency is, is as low as possible from your uh, physical uh, endpoint location to the, to the cloud. And also other things that you, can uh, can use is <clears throat> just flexibility on on the configuration of your application. So um, you can use Microsoft Endpoint Manager, as I said earlier, to deploy applications to your cloud PC. And if you have that network layer on the background in place, uh, those applications can just connect to uh, uh, to the backend from that application that runs inside the cloud PC. So the end user will just see the application showing up. Uh, via one of the clients that we support in a way that they have been using it on a local PC. And the great thing about having that um, uh, on-premises or backend connection in place is that you can just consolidate all your uh, internet databases and application servers in one location. And it doesn't really matter anymore where your physical location is of your endpoint, because if you're connecting from a physical PC to a backend service somewhere uh, on a different side of the planet, your latency is very high. But if your cloud PC sits in an Azure data center location that's close by to your uh, backend data, uh, then the connection over the remote desktop protocol determines your quality level of the cloud PC. But the backend, the 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 the, the, the uh, connection layer that happens on the cloud PC to the backend services is something that always keeps consistently low. So that's something to uh, to be mindful of. And next to, of course, the security benefits of um, yeah, layering all the data uh, inside your data center and have just a, a display protocol layer, network layer, encrypted over for a tree happening from the endpoint uh, up to the cloud PC environment. And that's the reason why a lot of uh, governments and security regulated uh, customers and scenarios are using uh, a virtualization technology and are interested in Windows, so Windows 365 uh, as well. 
So then we have the third option, which is hybrid Azure AD join. So with hybrid Azure AD join, you can still have the interaction with your own premises Active Directory uh, domain controller. So Kerberos and all those capabilities you have, perhaps some applications that are like a little bit older and require authentication to your Kerberos domain. That's all uh, possible to do as well. So that's what you see here. So you see uh, different components that you still need to bring as a customer. So same capabilities as part of an on-premises network connection. So an express route or site to site. And um, going a little bit more back and zooming into the customer hosted environment on the right side, you have that same need for an Azure subscription as I said before. So it's more uh, difficult uh, perhaps to onboard than of course the Azure AD join service. Uh, and one of the things you need to do and deliver is the, the, the domain controller and that configuration of Azure AD Connect as I said earlier. So you need to flip that Azure AD Connect setting to hybrid Azure AD. Uh, because without that, it, it will not uh, it will not work uh, correctly. You will see that as well popping up in that uh, uh, proactive um, uh, network connection, uh, Azure connection uh, service that 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 watchdog service network connection monitoring uh, uh, table that I just showed before. Uh, it will flip from uh, from pass to fill or give you a warning and notify the ad admin, the IT admin about it as uh, as well. So I already explained all the capabilities of hybrid Azure AD. So uh, there is as well uh, the option to, to use your, your environment on-premises. So um, if you have any on-premises infrastructure, uh, you can just uh, use that. So if you have um, like lots of legacy services in your environment and you have the need for Kerberos, then hybrid Azure AD probably is still the best way to configure Windows 365. Uh, that's an easy switch for you to Azure AD in the future because we already support it too. So you can determine your, your strategy of, of flipping a provisioning policy to Azure AD join if you're already in there. And if you layer all those applications on top, as I said before, um, it's an easy switch because your image will be just rejoined to Azure AD and your applications will be just layered on top of that because you separated them already from your golden uh, golden images um, from moving uh, moving forward if you are coming from an existing uh, virtualization uh, virtualization technology. So a couple of things I would like to highlight as well is, and I didn't do that in the previous presentation, is the capabilities we have for, for partners or automation you can build uh, in um, uh, Windows 365. So we have graph APIs right now that are available that you can use uh, to build native Windows 365 management and automated tasks from like, for example, MEM into your own solution. So we have partners like uh, like Nerdio and NetApp that, that are using those graph APIs right now to build own partner uh, solutions on top of Windows 365. But this can be used by just an IT admin as well to streamline your, um, your monitoring capabilities as well as your automation capabilities as part of the categories we, uh, we support for automating specific features inside the Microsoft Android Manager uh, console, for example. So if you're interested in creating your own like UX and do some management on top of that and simplify the processes even more because that's just how uh, your organization and your department works and streamline those um, those processes. You can go to aka.ms slash w365 Microsoft Graph Beta and you can uh, find the information you uh, you need for uh, for doing that yourself. So what about monitoring analytics and troubleshooting? So here are a couple of uh, yeah, tips and tricks and uh, what we uh, do for monitoring and improve your uh, total cost of ownership. And one thing I didn't share before is if you go for Windows 365 Enterprise, Endpoint Analytics is baked into the license. So there's no need for an extra map monitoring a solution uh, like log analytics or something like that to use on top of Windows 365 separately. Uh, the monitoring solution Endpoint Analytics is baked in, so pretty easy to use and all um, yeah, created and um, measures a desktop experience kind of uh, behavior. So 
If you go to a different solution on Azure, most likely that's more focused around server uh, orientated architectures and with endpoint analytics, it really focuses around the end user. And that's what we can deliver with Windows 365 as well. So think about uh, those alerts that I shared earlier, but you can as well create proactive recommend, uh, recommendations and remediations, meaning that in the endpoint analytics portal, you can create PowerShell script actions based on, hey, a, a cloud PC is excelling in CPU usage or RAM. And then if that happens, you can uh, throw in a PowerShell script that uh, does a reboot or something like that to solve the issue for the end user without any IT admin interaction or the need for a service desk uh, to, uh, to do something. So all kinds of capabilities that you can do in endpoint analytics to be uh, yeah, flexible in what you can do to uh, to make sure that the performance is going uh, going well. And as I said earlier, because everything is baked in, you have no need to bring in another uh, monitoring solution. So you can really narrow the investment that you do for your uh, cloud PCs as well as your physical PCs if you are not using MAM to manage your physical PCs as well in your environment. So here's a quick run, a run over of endpoint analytics. So if you're not familiar with endpoint analytics, here's where you can find uh, the uh, startup performance and as well some of the remoting connection settings that we built specifically for Windows 365. So you see the score for your full organization, but you can as well find the information per cloud PC. So what is the latency uh, from a user that connects from his physical endpoint to the cloud PC? All kinds of like proactive monitoring options that you can check in as an IT admin that belong to a, a virtualized solution that Windows 365 uh, is. And other capabilities you can see there is um, like, what if I'm still using Windows 10 and I want to upgrade to Windows 11? We have a dashboard uh, work from anywhere. And in that work from anywhere dashboard, you see if your cloud PC is ready to move up to Windows 11. And then from there, you can just go to one of the policy settings we offer to do an in-place upgrade to uh, to Windows 11 as well, all from the same, um, yeah, Microsoft Endpoint Manager console, all in M1. So pretty, pretty easy and straightforward to, uh, to do that. And one of the other things I would like to call out, if you are a user and um, an IT admin and you have problems in your environment, uh, you can also use some of the troubleshooting capabilities we offer out of the box. So for example, every Windows 10 and Windows 11 uh, cloud PC uh, and just the operating system in general has Quick Assist. And Quick Assist is a tool that is available in Windows that you can use as an IT admin or a service desk to just open and send a code to the other person to do remoting, um, yeah, remote help. So do troubleshooting, see what happens on the screen there, and then you can take over the ownership of that screen and solve the problem for that end user. And that's a great capability to have, and that removes as well the need to use and invest in a third party solution perhaps to, to do that management and troubleshooting as part of your Windows 365 environment. If you cannot solve it yourself and you need more help, for example, you can use as well, of course, the Microsoft Support Desk. Uh, so I will show a little bit more information how you can uh, can use that in a bit. But uh, another capability we are working on is the remote help feature uh, that uh, we released uh, or announced during the uh, Windows commercial event uh, three, uh, three weeks ago. And we are working on supporting that with Windows 365 as well, and that creates more capabilities to do management as well as part of your uh, Windows 365 environment, as well as uh, delegating different roles and capabilities to do troubleshooting in uh, inside your, your cloud PC environment. Other capabilities as part of troubleshooting, as I said earlier, is the resize feature. So with resize, you can do uh, yeah, a resize of your cloud PC to a higher or lower license, uh, which we will support in the future. Uh, but other capabilities you have in the Microsoft Endpoint Manager suite is what you see here on the screen. If you go to Devices and you click on a Cloud PC, you can do a restart, a restore, reprovision, resize, all those capabilities. You can do that directly from there as an IT admin. So all kinds of yeah capabilities you, you want to have uh, for a Cloud PC, which 
partly already were existing in the same devices as menu for a physical PC. So if you're an IT admin that already manages Intune Microsoft Endpoint Manager today for physical PCs, you will see a lot of like similar patterns as well as uh, capabilities you can use as part of Windows 365. And that's exactly kind of the vision we have. We want to narrow the gap of capabilities you have for a physical PC as well, for a cloud PC, for, for both the end user as well as the IT admin, as, as Scott was sharing in the beginning of this presentation. So if you have like help desk people, as I said earlier, that you want to uh, have to take over uh, control of a cloud PC, there is as well a new a remote assistance session uh, button on the right side that you see on the screen that you can use to set up remote sessions to, uh, to the cloud PC environment as well. And just to come back to the uh, original uh, proposed question, um, like if you have the need for help, like if there's something happening in the cloud PC environment, and you cannot really uh, yeah, find what's going on there. There's an easy way to just go into troubleshooting and help inside Microsoft Endpoint Manager and create a Microsoft support ticket in there. And then from there, our support desk will help you as soon as possible. And, and that's really, Kind of the next level third line support that we offer as well as part of uh, Windows 365. So pretty easy to um, to create and very fast reaction response time as well to all those uh, things. So with three minutes left, I have a couple of things that I would like to highlight as a, a call to action perhaps. So if you want to learn more about what you just saw today and want to dive deeper into some of the demos as well as get more hands-on experiences um, on the Winners in the Cloud uh, podcast, which I run with several guests like Steve Dispenza, uh, the CVP of Microsoft Endpoint Manager on Windows, or Scott Manchester that was just on the call as well. You can go to ak.mh slash Windows in the Cloud to find the Windows in the Cloud episodes. And if you go to uh, uh, ak.mh slash Windows 365 April updates, you go directly to the Microsoft Mechanics video that Jeremy and Scott just uh, released as part of the Windows commercial event launch. So all kinds of great assets you can use and perhaps can share with your colleagues. And we will also share the recording of this event somewhere early next week. So you can share that event recording as well with your colleagues and get them perhaps excited about the technology as you are uh, hopefully as well after hearing us uh, uh, speaking uh, in, in like the last two uh, two hours from now. So there are a couple of other uh, links that I would like to share as well. I will make sure they are represented in the chat so you can easily capture it. Uh, so those links uh, will have hyperlinks and I will share those uh, in just uh, two minutes in the chat so you can just capture them from uh, from there. So with that, I would like to uh, yeah, thank you and as well thank Scott and Jeremy for being great hosts and, and speakers on this first Windows 365 Accelerator event. This will not be the last one, so we will be back. And I, I'm really glad that there was so much interaction during the chat during this presentation. So I really thank you for watching and I hope to see you at one of the other events soon. So thank you.